Last October, we entered into a sermon series entitled God's Story, Our Story, where we began to work our way through the Old Testament and the New Testament, making the case that every story ultimately points to one story. And it's when we understand that one story of scripture from Genesis to Revelation that we begin to understand how it influences and impacts our story. But before we go to the New Testament, and we will in a couple of weeks, as we enter into Advent and the story of the Gospel of Matthew, I wanted to take the month of November to remember the story of the Bible. And we introduced maybe to some for the first time, these con- this concept of one story broken into four parts, that if you ever wanted to know the ultimate story of the Bible, you could see it broken into four parts from Genesis to Revelation. The story of the Bible begins in Genesis with the story of creation. And we looked at Psalm 8 to see how the story of creation influences our life and our world. And then we move to part two of the story of the Bible, the fall, the rebellion of humanity, that man decided to live independent from God and it brought brokenness in the fall into the world, and we talked about the realities of the fall last week. Well, this week we're gonna look at the realities of the redemption, the promised redemption that God did not leave us in our sin and in our brokenness in the garden, but that God made a way, beginning in Genesis 3.15, he made the promise, the promise of redemption that through the seed of the woman, that seed would crush the head of the serpent, And the rest of the story of the Old Testament is the promise of a coming Messiah that would bring redemption. What is redemption? It is simply the the purchasing. God is purchasing his people back, a people that have rebelled, a people that have fallen away. He is purchasing them back, but not according to their own efforts, but according to the work and effort of Christ. And we'll look at the story and the beauty of redemption as it's found in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is written by King David, a military victor, a spiritual leader, and the national hero for God's people. But King David takes a mighty fall, a major tragedy, as he falls into temptation with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And to make matters worse, not only takes another man's wife, but has that man killed in the heat of battle? And it leaves us wondering in Psalm 51, why in the world would God inspire a man to take his epic failure? Why would God inspire a man to take his tragedy, to write it down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, put it to music so that 2,500 years from then, we could be reciting it and reading about it today? The reason is simple, because all of us, like David, will come to the place in our life where we hit rock bottom and we realize the utter tragedy that we've made of our lives. And like David, we need to know that there is a chance and the hope of going home. It would be through the tragedy, but then the eventual redemption of King David, that we would be reminded that there is a way home, that there is a way home for broken sinners like David. We need to hear the song of God's great redemption. Psalm 51, written by David, to us this morning, the people of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you, You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you might be justified in your words, blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in my inward being, and you teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, that I shall be made clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore 
to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your willing spirit. And on this Lord's day, before we partake in communion, we are reminded that the grass continues to wither and the flower continues to fade, but the word of our Lord, no, the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. Are there things in life that seem absolutely irredeemable? Are there conditions and circumstances in our life or maybe in others' life, lives that seem like they're just beyond the point of no return? Maybe for some of us, we have a child, maybe a sibling or a spouse, maybe a colleague or a neighbor or a friend where we just admit to ourselves, maybe not even admit it publicly, that their lives are just irredeemable, beyond the point of no return. And the question in light of this passage this morning is, is there a way home in the midst of epic failure? Is there a way home for those that blew it, like David? As I said, David entered into sin. He took another man's wife, Bathsheba, and he went a step further and had the husband, Uriah, killed in the heat of battle. And as he's dealing privately with this sin, and the tragedy of his epic fail, I'm sure he's wondering to himself, is there any hope? Is there redemption for someone like me? Or me, King David, have I gotten to the place of no return? It would be months later that his spiritual advisor, Nathan, the prophet, would come to him and say there was this man that had a lot of sheep. He was very rich. And he lived next to a family that had no money as, at all, a poor family, and they only had one sheep. But the rich man looked out his window and he saw this one sheep and he said, that's the sheep that I want. Go and have it killed and brought to me so that I might eat and my hunger be satisfied. Nathan says, what would you do with this man? And David says, have him killed. And Nathan looks at him in a very sombering tone and says, you are the man. And David is left wondering, is there any hope? Is there any recovery for sinners like me? Brothers and sisters, we need to rehearse and remember the song and the story of redemption. Three brief things before we enter into the Lord's Supper concerning the redemption of God. The first is this, redemption leads to repentance. It was in light of the mercy of God. It was in light of the promise, of the promise redemption of God that David is rehearsing the mercy and the promise of God's redemption. It's with the mercy and the redemption of God in view that it leads David to a place of utter repentance. What does the Bible say? It is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And so it's in view of God's mercy, it's in view of God's redemption that it leads David to a spirit of repentance. You see, repentance does not mean simply asking for forgiveness. Repentance does not mean simply saying, God, I am sorry. Repentance means completely turning away from our sin and turning completely towards God. This is the spirit of repentance that David demonstrates. Now you see here that it's in view of God's mercy that David is not cavalier towards his sin. He's not flippant about his sin. He makes no excuses about it. He sees the mercy of God and he sees the promised redemption and it breaks him and it convicts him. And our sin should do the same. That in light of the mercy and redemption of God, it should pierce us to the core and should lead us to a spirit of repentance. But what does repentance involve for David? It revolves taking responsibility. Verse three, for I know my transgressions and my sin is before me. He doesn't sugarcoat it, he owns it. He takes responsibility for his sins. I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. He makes no excuses, but fully accepts responsibility for his sins. He doesn't say, I'm the king and the king can do whatever he pleases. He doesn't say, but you don't know how much I've sacrificed for this kingdom. And let me just say, I have seen more people stumble and fall when they take on a mentality of entitlement 
when they begin to justify their sin, when they begin to justify, well, I'm doing this because after all, we need a little pleasure in this world and in this life. I've, I've paid my dues. I've, I've, I've worked hard in my life. I've poured a lot into my family and my career. I've seen more people stumble and fall when they begin to ex- ex- dismiss and excuse away their sin And David does nothing of the sorts, but he owns it and he takes responsibility for it. But part of the spirit of repentance is not only taking responsibility, but he's honest about the problem. What does he say in verse four and five? Against you and you alone have I sinned. Now granted, David has sinned against a lot of people. David sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. He has brought shame and guilt and he has brought despair amongst a whole people, the entire people of God. But what does David recognize? He recognizes the gravity of his sin that ultimately, Lord, I have sinned against you and done what is evil in your sight. You see, David does not minimize the gravity of his sin, but he recognizes that I have committed treason against God. And then he goes a step further to say in verse five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity in sin my mother conceived me. At no place in this passage does David dismiss his sin or cast off blame. He doesn't say it's the external circumstances that led me here. It wasn't my exhaustion that led me here. It wasn't because of that woman that led me to this position. He says it was my inner corruption It's what theologians call the doctrine of total depravity, that my sin had nothing to do with my external circumstances, but it was actually in sin my mother conceived me. You see, what David is doing in his spirit of repentance is is getting to the core of his problem. I am the problem, not others, not my external circumstances. That is how you know you have a true spirit of repentance, full responsibility, full honesty about the depth of your problem. You can go home, but it means you first have to own it. Redemption leads to repentance. Secondly, redemption also promises restoration. It promises restoration. The restoration of what? Everything that was lost at the fall. Remember last week we talked about the tragedy of the fall in the garden brought about the loss of everything that we desire it, 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 we, we lost our innocence. We lost our, the presence with God. We lost our ability to commune with others and our, our ability to stand in the very presence of God. Because of sin, we were banished from the garden. And ever since, we've been trying to make our way back home. But the promise of redemption means the promise of restoration, the restoration of everything that was lost in the garden. Look at verse 10. It's the promise of a restored heart. David says, create in me a clean heart and a willing spirit. David reveals that through the redemption of God, we have the possibility of having a clean heart. David does not say to God, can you fix some things in my life? Can you clean up my life? He says, no, I need a deep renewal and cleansing of my heart and soul. David doesn't say, can you fix some things? He says, no, I need, a, I need a total renovation. I don't need a fixer-upper. I need you to come in and gut my life out and give me a new heart and a new soul. David is speaking to the idea and the promise of a new creation being formed through the redemption of God, restored, a restored heart, a restored soul, a restored spirit, internal transformation, But what else is restored? Verse 11, the presence of God. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. We lost the presence of God in the garden and the promise of redemption is that we now can have the presence of God, the presence of the face and favor of God, that we're now able to live our lives not wondering or questioning, is God's face shining upon me? Do I have his favor? Or do I have his condemnation? In the promise of redemption, we have the promise of the face of God now shining upon us, both now and forever. And what is the result of this restoration, the restoration of our heart and the restoration of the presence of God? The result is verse 12, a restored joy. What's David admitting? He's admitting that there is no joy besides the presence of God. God. 
listen to me. The world, the world balks at this idea. Wait a second, you're the king. You have every worldly pleasure at your disposal. You had the kingdom of God in the palm of your hands. You're saying you had no joy. We need to heed the word and the lesson of David. If you are a young person here this morning, a middle school student or a high school student or a young adult, it would be absolute absurdity to not heed the words of David. David had everything in the palm of his hands and he's saying to us this morning, there was the absence of joy in my life. I thought all of these things, if I acquired them, would bring me the joy my soul desires. It would be absurd to ignore the lesson of David's life. David is telling all of us this morning, whether you are eight or 88, that there is only joy found in the presence of God. Redemption leads us to a spirit of repentance and brokenness. It promises restoration. And lastly, redemption requires mercy. How in the world could this promise be guaranteed by God? How in the world could God ever promise broken people like you and me that we could be brought back home? It's one word, the promise of mercy. In verse one of Psalm 51, David says, have mercy on me, God, according to what? According to your steadfast love. That phrase, steadfast love, means his covenantal faithfulness. What David is saying is this, he's taking us back to the beginning of the Bible and he's saying, according to the love you showed to Adam, according to the love you showed to Noah, according to the love you showed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to that love, God, you did it before, would you do it again in my life? I've heard of this steadfast love passed down from generation to generation, and God, would you do it in my life according to your steadfastness, your love that never fails, would you give me that love? And then in verse seven, he says, therefore would you purge me with hyssop that I might be clean? He's speaking to the removal of his sins. Take, take the, the, the sin that is on my slate and, and wipe, me, wipe it clean. Take me and purge me, Lord. Would you do it? I need a deep cleaning of my sins. But then he goes further. And after the sin has been removed, wash me and make me whiter than snow. The whiter than snow is pointing to the good work of Jesus Christ, that the snow that is pure would point us to the pure righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see, what David desires is not a blank slate. He desires his slate to be made clean by the purging of hyssop, and then God, in return, would you wash me whiter than snow, that when God would look at me, he would not only see the forgiveness of sins, but he would see the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that makes me whiter than snow. This is the good news for all those who believe in Jesus this morning because it's the reality of being purged and cleansed. It's the reality of being made whiter than snow that points us in this passage to a greater king, a greater king for the people of God who would come in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the one who on the cross would perfectly cleanse us and perfectly wash us whiter than snow. You see, here is the good news this morning that Nathan and David would eventually reunite. And King David, we know the story of what happens with him and Bathsheba. One of his sons dies. And David goes appropriately to Nathan and says, has my son died on account of my sin? And Nathan says, no. But we know why. God's son died on account of David's sin. And that is good news for you and me this morning, that the Son of God died on account of my sin and on account of your sin. You see, the good news this morning for all those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, that the Son of God was crushed so that you would never be crushed, that the Son of God lost the joy of the Father so that you and I, through faith alone, could experience the joy of the Father both now and forevermore. And that is good news for weary sinners this morning. About a year ago, 
good friends of mine asked me to conduct a ceremony of vow renewal. They were celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary and I was honored to officiate the, the wedding vow renewal for them. And it was a sweet ceremony. They invited groomsmen and bridesmaids that had participated in their wedding ceremony 25 years ago. And I had the opportunity to remind this precious couple, good friends of mine, of what commitment they made a reminder of, of, of the sweet union between a husband and a wife 25 years later, that God is now renewing this covenant, this covenant and this vow that was made 25 years ago. And it was an encouragement, not only to this couple, but encouragement to all those that participated in this ceremony. When a few moments, we're getting ready to partake in a renewal of our covenant vows. You see, every time we come together in communion and break the bread and take the cup, we are being reminded of the vow that we have made to God. But more importantly, we're reminded of the vow that God has taken, that God has made, that he, through Jesus Christ, will always be our God and we will always be his people. As the bread is broken and the cup is poured out, we are reminded of God's steadfast love for you and for me. And so I welcome you this morning to the renewal of your covenantal vows that you took many years ago, maybe, that you have the opportunity to renew this morning. For some of you, you are here today and you have fallen and you can't get up. And some of you are so broken, wondering how could God ever love again a broken sinner like me? And it's not only preached to you this morning, but it is put on full display at the Lord's table that through the body and blood of Christ, you can come home if you've never had an opportunity to come home and receive the good news of Jesus Christ and to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I pray that you would look no further. In Jesus, you can. You can come home because the promise of God is this, though your sin be a scarlet, he will make you whiter than snow. Brothers and sisters, go home. There's mercy there.